Welcome everybody to this series of webinars between Manchester Metropolitan University and NS Hurikiya. My name is Dr. Araida Hidalgo. I am the international lead for the Department of Life Sciences in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. And today I'm going to introduce this new series uh, regarding engineering technology and renewable energies, uh, working along with colleagues from our Department of Engineering. It is my pleasure to help these institutions to work together to make sure that we can build bridges to foster collaborations and to show the students what is happening in the other side of the world, either in Mexico or in the UK. Welcome. We hope that you will join us for the four weeks that these webinars will be running. And I will now pass to the chair that will host today's webinar. Thank you, Alejandro. Hello, good morning, good afternoon in, in, in Manchester. My name is Alejandro Vargas. I'm currently the, the uh, I'm responsible for the Bachelor in uh, Engineering, Renewable Energies Engineering at Tenes uh, Juriquilla in Mexico. And it is my pleasure to moderate and to host this, uh, this uh, seminar series. And uh, we will start the first talk with uh, Dr. Carl uh, Diver, who, will, who is an academic lead on Industry 4.0 and a reader in industrial digitalization at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, before he got into academia, Carl was working in the manufacturing sector for more than 20 years, uh, first at a large multinational, and then he established his own consultancy. He worked at Delphi Automotive Industries at the R&D department and in the case of consultancy, he worked for multinationals and SMEs on a range of products. And more recently, Carl has led industry in this uh, 4.0 activity, which he, we will be talking about, and uh, doing research and teaching for the School of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering at the University of Manchester. Uh, uh, between uh, 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 things that he has done, he uh, is working on bringing many technologies together and materials and work closely with businesses in uh, what is called next generation solutions, which include the expertise on artificial intelligence, internet of things, big data, analytics, cloud computing. And um, well, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Carl. And uh, Carl, let's say the, uh, the cyberspace is yours to expose what you want to, to tell us. So we'll be receiving questions from you uh, with the, uh, via YouTube and uh, Facebook Live. So if you have questions, we will have some time at the end of Carl's talk to, to post them to him and, and maybe get uh, some answers. Uh, we, if we have too many questions, we'll have to select some, but uh, I, hope, I hope we have a lot. So thank you, Carl. Okay. Uh, gracias, Alejandro. Uh... Buenos dias, uh, me amo Carl Diver, and I'm delighted to be here and to, uh, uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you today. So I'll just try and share my screen. Um, so let me know if that's coming through okay. Okay. Oh, we're seeing your your other view of our. Oh, uh, the you can switch the. Yes, that's perfect. Is that better now? Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Carl Diver. I'm the academic lead for Industry Four at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, I'm, as Alejandro said. I'm a reader in industrial digitalization. So I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk to you today about what we do at Manchester Metropolitan University around Industry 4.0. And I'll touch on some of the wider things happening across the UK as well. Uh, so what is Industry 4.0? So first industrial revolution was steam and it really, you know, Manchester's considered the birth, birthplace of that and that was back in the 1770s. Uh, then fast forward about 100 years and we had electrification and that was around the 1870s. 
Many people think it might have been down to the kind of the Ford Motor Company uh, automotive and, and that side of things, but it was actually a, a slaughterhouse in Cincinnati uh, where we kind of first saw some of that uh, uh, electrification coming in. Then another hundred years forward and we get into the numerical control side of things around the 1970s. And we have these kind of hundred year steps, um, but we're now in the fourth industrial revolution and we're probably 50 years ahead of those other hundred year steps. And what is that really about? It's, um, you know, it's about connectivity. It's about digitalization. We all have smartphones. We're all used to connecting on social media, uh, ordering things online and expecting them to be delivered within you know, a couple of hours sometimes, uh, especially during the pandemic. There's been a lot of shift of moving things online, a lot of commercialization of things like that. So it's around digitalization, connectivity, data, accessing that data. But at each of these steps, we saw, you know, the driver for that was improving uh, process efficiencies, resource efficiencies. And I know that some of you on the call today are from the studying the renewable side of things and the technology. And, you know, both those elements will have a big role to play in Industry 4.0 or harnessing the technology of Industry 4.0. So why is this important? There are lots of facts and figures that are available. And, you know, this is just a small sh snapshot of that. But... You know, uh, it could have a $14.2 trillion impact on the global economy by 2030. You know, 67% of UK manufacturers recognize it as an opportunity. And on the back of that, there was a, a Made Smarter review that was put to government a number of years ago, uh, saying that there was a need for digitalization for SMEs or small medium enterprises, those those companies with less than 250 employees to start to adopt technology, to adopt, adopt digital technology to remain competitive. And on the back of that, the, the UK government uh, has invested somewhere around 150 million pounds uh, with a match coming from industry to help with that kind of productivity uh, increase. So, so we're seeing you know, governments, we're seeing companies starting to say, there's an opportunity here that we need to do something. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of you know different countries around the world where organizations realize that there's a, a gap in the talent gap or a digital uh, gap in the skills gap that uh, they're looking for people with the right skill sets to implement these tech kind of technologies. And I've also seen you know uh, that in Mexico you've uh, also doing things around uh, industry 4.0. I think. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think something like 98 research centers and that grew kind of probably exponentially over the last seven or eight years. Uh, some kind of clusters that for me are very much in the industry four uh, side of things on you know, uh, design, big data clusters, intelligent factories, automation, all of that feeding into the industry 4.0. So it looks like you guys are doing some interesting stuff as well on that. You know, and at Manchester Met, we've adopted uh, our kind of uh, our, I suppose, our ethos is around bridging the industry four skills gap, linking to industry, speaking to industry, understanding what industry's needs are, and looking at what we're doing from a research and a teaching point of view around uh, what we can do to help bridge that skills gap and bring academia and uh, uh, industry closer together. So. Many of you, if you're familiar with the Industry 4 term, will probably have come across the, the nine pillars of Industry 4 that was coined by Boston Consulting Group quite a number of years ago. Although more recently, I've come across, I think, 17 pillars now, but I didn't have enough space on my slides to get all 17 pillars in there. But uh, And that 17 pillars has been coined by uh, Henrik von Schiel, who's considered the father of Industry 4.0, and he worked with the German government in 2011-2012 in formulating what industry 4.0 is about you know but these nine pillars you know additive manufacturing big data cybersecurity these are all the kind of terms you'll hear related to industry 4.0 and when i look across manchester met and the university you know we're active in these areas we have a 6 million pound uh, center in collaboration with a number of universities in the northwest of england uh, looking at cybersecurity, working with SMEs and companies in the region for solutions around cybersecurity. We have an advanced materials and surface engineering research center, again, working closely around the area of additive manufacturing, uh, looking at advanced materials, uh, doing work around food packaging so that you, know, you can extend the uh, uh, 
uh, the shelf life of, uh, of food products and things like that. And uh, I think I've read that you know food is one of your uh, big sectors in, in Mexico as well. Um, and we see that industry four is more than just engineering. It stretches across many sectors. And we have the Manchester Fashion Institute uh, at Manchester Met. And there's some wonderful equipment and uh, activities going on with the Fashion Institute. And industry four, you'll also hear very often that it's about personalization and customization of goods, uh, and none more so than, than where we see opportunities of this in the, in the fashion sector. They've got body scanning technology. They've been doing stuff around uh, with world rugby, around uh, getting the right fit of uh, you know the, uh, uh, the the clothes that the uh, the rugby players wear. And what we see as well is that you know the uh, our colleagues in the uh, fashion institute are working with colleagues in engineering around additive manufacturing, and and those aspects of that personalization and customization. And our faculty of business and law, we've got. A, uh, the department focused on operations technologies, events, and hospitality. They're doing some interesting stuff around AR and VR or augmented reality and virtual reality, and also around digital supply chains. Uh, there's a real depth of knowledge around logistics and digital supply chains within that group. We have the Center for Advanced Computational Science and the Faculty of Science and Engineering, where, where I sit doing some wonderful stuff around AI, big data, and I'll touch on some of that in a while. And we've had a new professor come in uh, to lead on that as well, Professor Yong Hong Peng, who's considered a, a, you know, a, a renowned leading researcher and academic in the area of AI and leading into AI and healthcare as well. And it's that, again, multidisciplinary nature of Industry 4 and digitalization that it touches so many different sectors. Uh, for the people who are interested in the renewable side of things, we have uh, the Manchester Fuel Cell Innovation Centre. It was established uh, three or four years ago, uh, four million pounds investment, supporting companies uh, in the region looking at fuel cell technology and in particular hydrogen fuel cell technology. We have the Institute of Coding, which is part of a wider uh, network across the UK, uh, looking at bringing digital technologies and digital skills into uh, many different sectors. And that also includes uh, banking and uh, uh, sectors such as that. We have the Future Economies Research Center, and it's important that we look at the ec economic impact of this side of things as well. So they're doing interesting studies around the economic impact around industry four, uh, the impact around healthcare, if we're getting into that side of things. So we, we work closely with our colleagues there. And then we have uh, Print City, which is our 3D printing uh, facility at the university. And it's quite a unique uh, facility. We have over 70 printers now. It was established three years ago. It's grown exponentially. We have eight different technologies. And it's a center that is open, not just for students from engineering, but we have students from, like I said, the Fashion Institute, from architecture, from business and law, from music all coming into this space uh, and being created. Uh, and we established uh, an MSc in industrial digitalization, one of the first of its kind uh, about three years ago, uh, and bringing and allowing students from different backgrounds to come and study around industrial digitalization, around additive manufacturing. And one of the interesting things with that course is that we saw uh, in the first two years, nearly a 50-50 split between male and female, which is kind of unheard of in, in some of these kind of uh, more maybe traditional engineering courses. So we're quite proud of that fact. And it's an open space, it's a creative space. Um, and it, uh, and I guess industrial engagement is quite a strong element of what we do. And we work quite closely with Autodesk. Uh, it's a San Francisco based 3D design as you know, they create 3D models. Uh, so we work quite closely with Autodesk as well and have access to their uh, generative design packages as well for that kind of design optimization, topological optimization. So uh, some really interesting stuff. And if you want to look at our, our website and uh, look at Print City, you'll see some of the interesting things going on there. Uh, some of our students on that course also have uh, their own kind of bios, their own area on that site. So you can see some of the projects that they're working on. I mentioned the Center for uh, uh, CFAX, uh, the Advanced Computational Science. 
uh, my colleague, Professor Han, pictured here, has been doing some really interesting work around applying AI in the area of, of farming. Uh, and this is a, a project, uh, if you're interested, I think you can download the app. It's called AgriOne. It's looking at uh, detecting disease in crops. So you have uh, uh, the drone flying over the, uh, the, the crops taking images and then AI is looking for any issues around potential disease and it allows the farmers then to uh, implement and intervene. Uh, so uh, an interesting application of AI. And one of the things in kind of my job at the university, I've uh, the very privileged opportunity to be able to work with uh, colleagues in the different faculties uh, who are involved in uh, digital uh, technology, digital research. Uh, so. About a year and a half ago, we ran a sandpit between the Faculty of Business and Law and Science and Engineering uh, to bring those uh, uh, academics and, and colleagues working around digital technologies together. And one of the projects that's grown out of that, and we actually just submitted uh, a proposal yesterday uh, for funding in the UK around applying AI in healthcare, but we had colleagues from uh, uh, health science, from computer science, from business school, from engineering uh, uh, involved in this project. So I'm going to play this short video. I hope it plays. Line 4.0 is an ambitious project which brings together an interdisciplinary group of researchers, stakeholders, GPs, and patients with two streams of work. One stream being to create an AI algorithm to better predict the risk of cardiovascular disease and the other stream being working with those stakeholders, GPs and patients to develop a way for this to be used in practice and make the most difference. Medical practitioners are guided by risk uh, algorithm uh, for CVD prediction mainly based on limited variables across a homogeneous uh, population, uh, which do not assess the impact of an individual patient's unique set of uh, risk factors. This is a really exciting project that's bringing together experts from across the university, experts in the Northern Care Alliance, the Salford CCG and patient representatives, where we'll look at digital technologies such as artificial intelligence, harnessing data that exists, historical data that exists around cardiovascular disease. The Salford data set is a really important data set. It, uh, it spans 18 to 20 years worth of data uh, from the GPs, but also from hospitals. And as such, it's, a, it's fairly unique within the UK. There's only a couple of other places like it. But we believe that it holds great promise because within that data set, there are, there are likely to be novel signatures that indicate someone's at risk of a heart attack. Working with GPs, healthcare professionals and patients throughout the project is absolutely central to what we're trying to do. It's really important that we don't create something in isolation and that it's usable and practical for those around us. I think it's really important that people get involved in these kind of opportunities because they really do have the chance to make a difference. And I think by getting people involved in these kind of of activities then they can make suggestions um, they can get their thoughts and their ideas heard and ultimately make a difference to the outcomes of that research for the future of the project i hope that we can create a sustainable group of both academic stakeholders patients and gps to create a real difference and go forward with this project and beyond the project has the potential to result in an extension of healthy life expectancy for many individuals this will allow people to work and contribute to society for longer. It will reduce the burden on the NHS and will enable people to spend more quality time with other ones. So what I really like about this is those different elements uh, and sectors and specialisms coming together. And it's using this technology for good and for the benefit of uh, our wider population. So we're really excited about this project and the bigger vision that we have of where that can go. So, and again, I guess industry four is this, you know, multidisciplinary approach. And I mentioned the MSc in industrial digitalization. Uh, these are three students that I supervised uh, a number of years ago uh, uh, in the first cohort of this industrial digitalization MSc. Uh, one was from a business background, the other two had a kind of a product design background and we were working with a, a well-known footwear brand, looking at 
uh, you know, the design of shoes. Um, so we needed to look at 3D scanning technologies. We needed to embed smart sensors. And then we looked at the design and the topological optimization uh, using generative design. But we pulled in other experts across the university as well. So sports psychologists, uh, physiotherapists, and also worked with our colleagues in the kind of biomechanics side of things, looking at gait analysis and uh, pressure sensors on the floor in the gait uh, analysis, looking at how people were loading uh, uh, on the footwear as they were uh, stepping uh, down and moving around. So it, it's bringing all of those things together, sharing of that technology, and then using the technology to come up with solutions. This was uh, uh, the start of the project top left. Uh, as I said, it grew uh, by quite a lot and we pulled in other uh, colleagues and experts from across the university. So a very successful project and kind of building on the strength of that, uh, that got us into looking at more around footwear and kind of supply chains. And we're currently working on a, uh, as part of a, a wider consortium to put together a, a proposal. We've been successful in the first stage. Uh, we'll be submitting a, a proposal by the end of this month to uh, form a UK digital supply chain hub. And at Manchester Met, we're going to be looking at the supply chain side and the textile side of things. Um, but other companies involved are the likes of Accenture, uh, Google, Siemens, and, and others. So it's a very exciting project looking at all elements of the supply chain. Uh, I also sit on the uh, industrial uh, advisory board, or I'm the chair of the industrial advisory board in the Department of Engineering. And I think it's that element again of that strong link with industry and understanding what industry's needs are uh, and having that element of collaboration. So uh, we've got a very vibrant uh, industrial advisory board, over 40 members from micro enterprises to large multinationals. Um, and this uh, January, we ran a uh, employability week for our students. Uh, we had over 15 companies involved. It was all done virtually. Uh, the company set challenges, uh, the students worked in multidisciplinary groups uh, to address those challenges in a 24 hour period and then kind of pitched back the next day. I think there were over 75 sessions run that week and the whole event was opened by Carl Ennis, who's Siemens a CEO for UK and Ireland. And I want to play this short snippet from his uh, his talk. at the, the Give launch. the best day work that you can. And, and absolutely don't leave leave anything on the sideline. Absolutely give it. And by the way, if you're not enthusiastic about the role that you're doing, such that you want to give it your best, go and do something else because life's too short, right? So this isn't, you know, really, really give it your best. When you do that, you will be noticed, right? People see that. They see people who deliver on their promises, who do excellent quality work, and they get opportunities asked. And then my second guidance is, when you get those opportunities, grasp them. Because even if you don't think you can do that, somebody else thinks you can, uh, and they're probably right. And that message resonated with a lot of our students, but also uh, the opportunities that our students have to develop the skill sets around Industry 4. And during that week, we saw some of those students uh, gain that opportunity through the, the, through the skill sets that they have. We have strong links with Siemens. Uh, we work part of a, a new initiative called Connected Curriculum, and we're looking at, uh, it gives us access to Siemens software and uh, hardware and also uh, uh, training material. We're at the start of that journey, but we're looking at how we embed that into some of our uh, courses, such as the MSc courses on the, on the right-hand side. And actually this week, we've just launched uh, for our second year students a uh, project based on the UK ventilator challenge, which saw a large number of companies coming together last year uh, to start the ramp up of uh, ventilator production. Our students now are working with some of the technologies that were used in that challenge. Uh, so it keeps it relevant, but they're also getting those skill sets uh, uh, embedded. Uh, the other side, I've touched on the cyber foundry. Uh, we've got the AI foundry that was recently funded, I think 4 million in funding, again, supporting SMEs in the region around AI. Uh, we've also just secured funding of around 3.2 million uh, to establish Print City Network, which is building on the, uh, the focus of Print City, uh, but an area dedicated for SMEs to be able to come in and engage with uh, additive manufacturing technology. Uh, all of this also has to tie into sustainability and that's very much a core and a strategy within Manchester Met. 
Uh, these are an example of some European projects that we're involved in. Surmaps looking at taking recycled concrete, using that as uh, from an additive manufacturing point of view, looking at creating street furniture initially, but it'll help develop the technology uh, in, in years to come to have other applications. Transform CE is a project looking at taking domestic plastic waste and using that as a feedstock for additive. And Share Repair is one that's looking at uh, consumer electronics and the repair side of, uh, of that. Knowledge transfer partnerships is an area that we're very strong in and it's funding that comes through the UK government to help industry and universities work together with students or recent graduates uh, working in the company, bringing technology from the university and embedding it in companies. We're consistently in the top five in the UK with a number of uh, knowledge transfer partnerships running. And these are some of the stats around the, the impact that it's had on the university and in businesses. We believe in getting our students out and meeting with industry. Uh, and before the pandemic, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago or two years ago now, uh, we were part of uh, an industry forward trade show that was held in central Manchester. Top left, you can see a stand that was dedicated to our students uh, and they were able to display the work that they had. Uh, top right, you see some of our students on the main stage uh, talking about their experiences around digital technologies. Um, and I think with that, I'll just leave this video playing. And it's just a, a snapshot of what that show was like. But we had over 70 members of staff involved over two days. Uh, and from all, I suppose, uh, faculties and uh, different departments across the university. It was a real opportunity to showcase some of the great stuff that's happening across the university that is related to Industry 4.0. So with that, I would like to say thank you, gracias. It's been a pleasure. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, we we have, for the time being, we have no questions from, from, from Facebook or, or, uh, or YouTube, but I have a question, okay. <laughs> so if I may ask one. Um, if I understand correctly, Industry 4.0 is all about uh, communication. You know, so communicating, well, it's not all about that, but, but has to do a lot with communication, with, with uh, communicating uh, with, uh, within the, the manufacturing process that uh, all the, the, the parts are kind of working together in, 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 in harmony, let's say. And I, I've always wondered how uh, resilient is, is, is this industry being made? Because uh, what happens uh, when there is failure? Is, is, is this uh, of, of some critical component, I mean? So do you mean failure from a, like a maintenance point of view or do you mean failure in capturing the data? Yeah, for example, in capturing the data or in, uh, in uh, let's say, a critical component fails and, and then that is critical so that you cannot continue the process in, in, in what you had planned in some way. Yeah. So is there research being done on, on, on this uh, issue? So I think there is on resilience. Uh, I guess there are issues around, you know, your, uh, I suppose, how secure your networks are and how resilient, you know, your data transfer is. So. Uh, so there are challenges around that and, you know, and making sure that, you know, those systems uh, don't fail. I think you also have issues around, uh, you know, how well your components are, are, are going to actually function when they're in operation. Uh, I suppose one opportunity around that is the side of additive. And I actually had some conversations with some large multinationals yesterday around uh, issues that they have around if something breaks on the shop floor or on their production line. Uh, waiting to get parts from an OEM. And, and we've had a number of companies looking at that opportunity, opportunity of having their own 3D printing facility so they can sprint, print spare parts on site, on demand when they need it to help them get over that ramp of waiting for maybe the specific part to come from the OEM. So, uh, so there's an opportunity, I guess, to harness the technology in that way. Uh, and that then develops some of the skills of the workers on the shop floor because there are challenges around that, uh, getting some of the CAD skills uh, in place that allows them to be able to design that fixture uh, that they might need to be able to kind of keep running. So. Great, thank you. We have two more questions from, from the audience. So one is from a student. So he says, uh, do you think at least some degree of knowledge in 
data analysis or digitalization of any kind is needed despite your area of expertise? So how, how important it is to know about yeah. data analytics and, and digitalization? I think there are elements of that. So I suppose a good example is one of my PhD students. He was a mechanical engineer um, and you know, uh, he moved on to do, so he was an undergraduate, he moved on to do his PhD with me around electrochemical machining, uh, which is kind of one of the processes I used to work in in automotive. Uh, but we saw the, the requirement to be able to capture data, get it on the cloud, and uh, be able to visualize that data for different people because we're developing a kind of a machine that would be potentially used for commercialization. So even as a design engineer and a mechanical engineer, you had to develop some of the skill sets around kind of cloud computing, uh, being able to connect. Uh, so we were using things like Arduino, uh, these open source platforms, uh, Node-RED programming, I guess. So not getting into detailed programming, but that kind of flow programming side of thing. So there's a lot out there that you can kind of self-train as well. Um, so you don't need to be an expert in it, but I would say that you're an expert in one area, but you have to probably gather knowledge in other areas that uh, you can do some, you know, be the, the low level side of things. But you definitely need, I would say, as we're moving forward to have that flexibility and adaptability and to be open to, to learning skill sets in other disciplines. Okay. Um, we have one, maybe one last question because uh, otherwise we will be running out of time. So, uh, so Dr. Giordano asks us, uh, you, I wonder who is the relation, what, how is the relation between industry and the university to understand the current needs and inform curricula working for you? How much have your curricula changed based on, I guess, based on, on, on the, this relationship between industry and academia? So the, I suppose a perfect example of that is the industrial digitalization of MSC. So that came about uh, from looking at what was in the Made Smarter report that went to, to government uh, as that unit was, or that course was being developed. Uh, industry was brought in to talk to them. Uh, so we had uh, a wide range of, uh, I suppose, different sectors telling us what their needs were. And that uh, course was developed around that. Um, and with the other MSc programs, uh, we're having conversations also with the likes of Stevens around, you know, what are the things we're looking at? Uh, there are areas we need to make sure that uh, obviously uh, some of the course uh, elements are delivered. Uh, but we need to look at some of the soft skills as well. And uh, so at the moment, there's a lot happening around maybe the soft skill side of things. So uh, so you go for an interview, uh, you're asked about some of the academic side, but very often you're also asked about other skill sets that you've developed. And one of the things we're trying to do on that side with our industrial advisory board is running the things like employability week, where you develop some of the other skill sets of that teamwork and you know working under a tight timeline with people you may not have worked with before. So. So it's going well uh, and it's we're seeing i guess uh, we're really enthusiastic about uh, the willingness of industry to give up time and to come in and, and to work with us and uh, i think we've been blown away actually by the uh, the willingness of industry to do that so uh, so it's, yeah it's, it's it's working really well great so it's good that you tell us that because that that's that's uh, showing us that uh, somehow NS is doing, is going in the right path, in the right direction, also fostering the other, these, uh, soft skills on, on, on students. I think the other point to add to that is from an accreditation point of view, our accrediting bodies uh, have been uh, <coughs> yeah, impressed by uh, how we're engaging with industry as well. And it's really helped uh, another kind of string to our bow, I guess, around accreditation of our courses. Okay, great. <laughs> Well, uh, time has gone very quickly, so uh, we have to prepare ourselves for, for our next uh, speaker. So we thank you, Carl, with, uh, with uh, a yes. <laughs> thank you for, for, for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, we have some other questions, but uh, I guess we, we don't have now time to, to, but maybe we can send them to you. And, and in that case, and you can, you can yes, answer of them directly. Yeah. If, Feel if, free that's to, no problem. Uh, to pass on my details. Okay, thank you. So let me then introduce um, our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alejandro Franco Piña. He is uh, he's a, currently a professor at uh, NS Juriquilla. He has uh, 
He was uh, just starting uh, as a professor at NS uh, last October, so he's one of our our, our new uh, say professors at the, at the at the university. He is currently he got the degree in, in a doctor in engineering in 2017, and he's a member of the Sistema Nacional de Investigadores of the National System of Researchers. He has more than six years of experience in teaching and in in research in the areas of mechatronics and uh, renewable energy, uh, advanced electronics, simulation, among others. And uh, he uh, was working first uh, with uh, CIDESI, uh, with a center here in Querétaro, working on, on, on some robotic uh, prototypes. And then he started working on, on, on wind system, wind engineering, so wind systems, uh, uh, and and renewable energy from wind, and right uh, as uh, he did a, a stay at the uh, Technical University of Berlin, uh, in working on smart blades for for uh, 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 generators for for yeah, wind generators, and um, so he he has uh, he will talk to you about his current research interest, and uh, so I welcome then. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Franco. Thank you, Alejandro. Hello, everybody. Uh, I try to share the presentation. Let me second. Perfect. Uh, it's okay. Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, uh, hello everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation uh, to this important binational seminar. In this presentation, we are going to talk about a new diffusor model for wind turbines, as well as the evaluation of its performance. And the content of the work will, will be divided uh, into five sections. First, I will give you a background on the technology behind the fusers. After this, we will present the proposed methodology to carry out uh, this study and its future experimental validation. And then we will present uh, the results obtained to date and the conclusions and, and this conclusion allows us to continue studying future models of the futures. Finally, I will present you um, the future work plan. Uh, well, wind energy is currently considered uh, as one of the most important technologies for electricity generation, especially when we take into consideration economic and environmental circumstances. The wind uh, power industry is an age of substantial growth as a result of advances in different areas of technology. Adding to this, we have uh, the problem uh, about the environmental pollution and uh, this problem have made urgent the need to increase the performance of the wind turbines. Um, what about uh, diffusers? Well, diffuser augmented uh, wind turbines or its acronym D8WT have been proposed by numerous scientists as a way of achieving this power increase. In few years, uh, one, uh, we can uh, see uh, the difference in the output performance between a small wind turbine with a diffuser at the same turbine, but uh, without it. Uh, it's easy to see uh, the path that uh, is achieved and the power could increase up to four times. And this phenomenon uh, behind the, the, the this increase uh, is the diffuser. The diffuser creates a negative pressure zone downwind of the turbine that increase uh, the air mass flow through the plates of the turbine, thus increasing the power 
output. Um, nowadays, uh, there are uh, mainly three types of uh, diffusors. Uh, first one uh, is the conical diffusor, are the simplest kind of diffusor as they depend only on the length of the wall and its angle. While flange diffusor are the most complex um, due to having more parameters such as the wall shape, its angle, and uh, its shoulders. And uh, we are going to have a special uh, type of uh, diffusor. They call airfall diffusor are of a great interest to the researchers because uh, there is a wide uh, variety of airfalls and uh, the other is that there is a lot of information available publicly about airfall performance uh, and its aerodynamic performance uh, under different wind conditions. Mm. And um, what does it make uh, interesting to the airfoil diffusors? Well, uh, first, uh, a higher aerodynamic performance. This is the relation uh, between CL and CD coefficient. This relation will result in a larger mass flow augmentation ratio when an airfoil is used as uh, diffuser geometry. So, uh, there are a lot of airfoil diffuser for long wind speed conditions. But uh, an special type of these devices are the blunt trailing edge airfoils. In figure three, we can uh, see a, a blunt trailing edge. Uh, it looks like uh, the trailing edge uh, was cutted. So this is the shape of the, uh, uh, the blunt trailing edge. This study, uh, for this reason, this study uh, presents the evaluation of a novel diffuser based on a blunt trailing edge using CFD simulation and uh, an experimental validation method proposal. Uh, let's continue. In this slide, uh, we got the methodology represented by this diagram. This is divided by two main stages. Uh, we can see in the blue uh, square the first stage that uh, that includes airfoil validation, angle selection, uh, model implementation, CFD simulation, and, and these activities uh, let us uh, obtain a diffuser performance comparisons. And the AF F uh, 300 is our promising diffuser, so we need validate through experimental results. For this second stage is uh, is going to be important, and it's, it's also important to say that these activities are running right now. So this integrates the future manufacturing is, uh, the selection of the instrumentation strategy. Uh, as a future work, we're going to uh, have a wind tunnel testing, and finally we uh, we will have the future experiment. Experimental the, ex, the diffuser experimental validation. Okay, so um, for the first um, step uh, is the airfall validation and angle selection. And this author created a new airfall in the year of 2012. And this airfall and uh, this new airfall profile. Uh, was created by increasing the trailing edge of the S1210 airfoil by 3% of the court. The results showed that this airfoil outperforms the CLCD ratio of other low speed airfoils while delaying the stall angle. So it was born the AF300 airfoil. Um, also, it's important to say that uh, the airfoil used in this study were the S1210 and S1223. These airfoil were gathered from the available literature for being identified as the best performing long wind speed airfoils. Well, uh, the angle of attack uh, for the transversal section of the diffuser was selected based on the parameters that give the best performance results in studies made by other authors. 
there are two design, design parameters. One is a good relation between the diameter D of the turbine uh, and the eight of the diffusers. Uh, we can see the, uh, the, the parameters here in the figure six. Uh, that do, another one is the length of the diffuser L uh, in relation uh, with the uh, diameter of the wind turbine. Uh, after this, a model, in, in this study, a model was performed to maintain the horizontal lanes constant with varying both the angle of attack and the court length until the desired H, D, and L, D ratios were met. Uh, the resulting angles, uh, 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 we have the resulting angles here in the slide uh, for the three different uh, diffusers. So, uh, in the uh, model and CFD implementation, and we have uh, we implemented the, the actuator disk model to account for the wind turbine uh, diffuser system, the interaction uh, between a wind turbine, the, the simulation of a wind turbine, uh, and the diffuser system. The complete theory uh, of the actuator disk model uh, can be found in, in this reference. So uh, we don't uh, talk about uh, this uh, model. And the implementation uh, well, um, was performed in ANSYS land. The flow in uh, this equation uh, relates the uh, uh, pressure, uh, differential pressure, and the uh, thickness of the media of the, uh, the fluid. With this model, uh, we implemented the, the CFD simulation. CFD is uh, computational fluid dynamics. So the computational simulation with a full flow solver were implemented in order to analyze the flow and the aerodynamic performance of the wind turbine diffuser systems. In figure seven, uh, we can see the mesh refinement for the porous zone or the actuator disk. And uh, we can see the uh, small elements around the diffuser. Mm, as a result, uh, uh, the aerodynamic performance uh, comparison was performed between the three uh, diffusers for a low Reynolds. The performance comparison was developed using the software Cubelate. Cubelate is a software developed by the uh, Technical University of Berlin. It's an open source software. So if uh, you want to uh, prove the software, it's gonna uh, be great if you download for free. And this software Im implements the panel method used in Xfold. So we we could uh, obtain the differential of uh, leaf coefficients and the relation with the uh, gaps uh, coefficient for different uh, degrees for the three different airfalls. So um, according to these figures, it can be evidently seen that the AF300 uh, shows a better aerodynamic performance compared with the other two airfalls. So after this, um, and for uh, made um, qualitatively comparison, um, we obtained this uh, three image of the flow around the, the, the three different diffusers. So um, in figure, 10 shows the flow close the, to the section between the diffuser and the actuator disk. It's important to infer that uh, the flow, when, when, well, first we need to see and identify that the flow uh, separation zone is weaker for the AF300 uh, diffuser. And it's, it's important to infer for this, that less energy is lost due to the viscous effects in the wake behind of the diffuser. And for this, uh, according to this, uh, more available energy can be harnessed by the wind turbine. So, um, finally, as a simulation result, uh, we have the table one 
that is the uh, results of, com uh, of comparison of the um, performance of the three diffusers models that was evaluated by calculating calculating the increment of the uh, kinetic energy. Uh, in figure 11, uh, we have the comparison uh, of in the wind velocity profile. It's evident uh, that the uh, red line uh, have an in increment in the wind velocity and also it will uh, provocate uh, better performance in the wind turbine that is using this uh, type of diffuser. Um, so in the table one, uh, we see the, the, the values and um, we have a significant increment in the percentage of the aument tension by about 7% in comparison with the uh, other two diffusers. Well, uh, in this slide, we are uh, seeing the working process and the expected results. We have uh, the um, manufacture, sorry, sorry. We have the manufacture um, process and uh, we, uh, we are suggesting uh, two uh, methods for the, the manufacture of these diffusers. First one is the 3D printing with a subsequent surface finishing uh, and the other one is bacon infusion with fiberglass. And, and this second uh, process uh, will be required uh, collaboration with the Autonomous University of Querétaro. Uh, uh, so uh, it's important, it's an important uh, step uh, for the manufacturing of the diffusers. The other one is the um, selection of a, a good or adequate instrumentation strategy. First, it's required the, selec the selection of the sensor uh, with microelectromechanical systems technology. Uh, these sensors allow us to embed the sensors into the surface of the diffusers to measure the pressure profile. Uh, that is important because uh, these MEMS um, don't interfere with the uh, free flow wind. So uh, this pressure data will be compared with the simulation data for validation. And on the other hand, we got uh, a wind velocity measurement for different radial location inside the diffuser geometry. This measurement will be relevant to verify the velocity augmentation inside the diffuser. Okay. Well, as a conclusion, this work identified a promising blown trailing nature for, for improving the performance of dots in a comparative simulation study of the aerodynamic performance under low Reynolds number condition, the AF300 effort presented better aerodynamic efficiency and a higher CL coefficient compared with the other diffusers. So um, table one show an increment in the energy captured in the dot system of the 49% uh, with respect to the actuator disk without diffusers. And it was identified that is, it is essential to select an adequate manufacturing process and to develop a robust instrumentation um, and data acquisition system for future wind tunnel test. And also, the conclusion is that experimental validation strategy of diffusion model will be based on the analysis and comparison of the data obtained through the wind tunnel test and the simula simulation results. The results presented in this work open a new line of uh, research exploring different geometries for bloom trailing edge airfoil, especially designed for uh, DOTS application. DOTS, I, I told you, is uh, diffuser augmented wind turbines. So uh, finally, as a um, future work, we, we will need to implement the wind tunnel test. Uh, we have two alternatives, the lab uh, air equipment that it will be installed in NS UNAM, and also uh, the wind tunnel in Instituto Tecnológico de la Laguna. 
and it will depend on the availability. So, um, okay, we have the references and uh, well, thank you for your attention and uh, any body have a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. We have, uh, we have at least one question uh, for, uh, oh no, it's, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a question for, for, uh, that was answering a question from, from the last uh, presentation. I, I do have, uh, uh, I do have one question uh, regarding these uh, air diffuser systems and it's uh, the, the increase in, uh, in, let's say performance is uh, around 50% more. But uh, how are these diffuser systems uh, um, relate to the increased cost of, of manufacturing and the increased cost of operation and uh, maybe of, of installation and the weight and, and, and things like that in a wind turbine? How, how do they add up? Well, and it's, it's a good uh, question. And also in, in this uh, slide, talk about, um, for example, um, the manufacturing of a diffuser with a trailing edge. The trailing edge is a sharp uh, trailing edge. It's, it's really complicated. So um, this is a new alternative for uh, this uh, manufacturing process that is hard to, uh, to carry out. So and uh, this increased uh, the cost of the wind turbine for for um, but the, the another important thing is the um, these diffuser are implemented in a small wind turbines and the reason is that uh, the turbulence that we uh, we, we will find in the uh, an example in um, buildings or cities small uh, we know that the small uh, wind turbine uh, are designed by the environment uh, uh, inside of the city or um, in isolated uh, or remote uh, places so uh, i think that uh, the increase in the performance of the wind turbine is uh, more relevant than the cost of the the manufacture of the, the diffuser. Okay, thank you. I, I think this was a very interesting talk following the, the talk on Industry 4.0 because I think in, in some sense, uh, Industry 4.0 will have or should have a big impact on the manufacturing processes of, of, of these yeah. turbines. So you, you talked about additive uh, 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 manufacturing, for example, for, for designing the, the, the the diffuser and, and things yeah. like that. So, well, I, I don't know if you can comment a little bit on that. Just to finish. Yeah. Obviously, I think that it will be uh, uh, an important thing that the uh, uh, additive manufacturing in these uh, prototypes. And also, we have the uh, 